Everybody hear me in the back? So normally I give like a five minute grace period, like, you know, let people straggle in, but like there's no more seats. I would just say I really, really appreciate it. It's fantastic for my ego. So thanks for showing up. So I'll just get cracking. You know, anybody can go to the Node.js talk afterwards, which is probably going to be much more interesting. Everyone's like, what's Node.js? Who knows what Node.js is? Yeah, it's going to be the, the death of all other programming languages. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Anyway, so that's the, that's the extent of all the technical, you know, hardcore technical stuff I'm going to get into today. My name is Neil Green. You've never heard of me because no one has. Last year I gave a talk on the ROI of refactoring Lego versus Play-Doh. Did anyone come to see it? Awesome. Thank you so much for coming back despite having seen it. The talks I like to give the most are ones that are more on theory and philosophy in our uh, industry. I don't favor talks that are about particular technologies because they tend to go out of fashion very, very quickly. So this is sort of following in that theme from ROI. When I was approached by DevNexus to speak again this year, I thought, you know, well, let me keep going with ROI. But I wrote my own outline and became totally bored with it. And I said, I don't want to go to my own talk. So I shifted gears to a topic that was really, really important to me. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you, you know, as this preamble is people are like sitting high, um, sort of weird, and people at the door. Uh, sorry, uh, return on investment, just a, a business term. Yeah, so don't get freaked out by people sitting to your right. Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, so some sort of preamble uh, before we get into it. So I, uh, since 2006, I've been in some capacity a technical team lead, taking on managerial and architectural uh, responsibilities in sort of a in, in several different companies. Uh, what's interesting is that the more you get promoted in your career, the harder it is for you to code, just from time constraints. Anybody else here is in a sort of a lead position and you're having trouble coding? Just You just can't find the time. And even when you do find the time, it's in fits and bursts. So you really don't get that sort of juicy stretch of uh, coding that you got back when you were just a, a regular developer. The turning point for me, the engineers I brought on and trained, you know, we were talking, you know, I came in the car back from lunch, and I totally botched the question on spring injection. Just like, just totally botched it. And there were sort of chuckles at my expense in the car, and I was like, I can't believe I blew that. And he said, you think maybe it's because you don't code every day? And at that point, I said, that's it. So... Uh, for my next job, I basically spent, see if anybody who interviewed me is in this room, like an hour explaining to them why I did not want to go back to being in a lead role, because actually my true passion is coding. I like coding. I don't hate coding. I, I've heard it said before that people, they manage their career up into management so they can avoid coding, right? But I actually love coding. But one of the things is that when you haven't coded for God knows how long, you get slow. You get real slow. And it's sort of embarrassing, right? You sort of go, spend all this time and you, you sort of hit a certain level. You're sort of a big deal. And someone says, hey, can you write this for me? And you're like, uh, what's operator precedence one more time? Because I'm... A little, I can't quite remember. I know there's like an and and a parens, but so, so at the end of the day, uh, what I had is the uh, opportunity, even though I wasn't coding, I had the opportunity to observe lots of really great developers, right? Guys who worked with me, guys who worked for me. And I got to pick out what people were doing to make them go, you know, so fast. And they were guys who were just seemingly telepathic. They could just make code appear. And what I noticed is that they had a certain characteristics that were common among all of them. So when I started this job and it was time for me to start over, I sort of said, I'm going to pull from all these guys. So I sort of wrote a diagram with all of their names, and I said, this guy does this, this guy does that. And at my current job, it has worked out you know, surprisingly well. Right? You, know, you don't want to say you, you kick ass and take names, which you sort of do, but you can't say that in the, in the settings. But it's gone, it's gone really, really well. Uh, I've got a lot of positive feedback from people around me. So it seems to be working. So what I'll do today is take you through that. I managed to talk about nothing for five minutes just to let people trickle in. Is I'm going to take you through that sort of journey of what's working for me right now. And what it is is really a reflection of these, you know, a lot of just fantastic developers who, who just, you know, at the time run circles around me. Now, well, we'll see. We'll see. So at the end of this, uh, at the end of this talk, we'll, I, I can't offer a money back guarantee because uh, I'm not getting paid for this. But, but what it comes down to is you'll find something in this talk that will speed you up. I'm taking sort of a holistic approach to it. There'll be something in there for you. So because I'm like crazy nervous, but trying not to let you know, just hang on to questions until the end so that I can just keep the flow going. Just as we get into the talk, just a disclaimer. I said nothing matters more. There are things that matter more than coding fasts, like uh, babies and puppies and kittens. <laughs> so now... Uh, let's sort of getting into what exactly coding fast is, right? You know, coding fast is being is, is portrayed a lot in media, right? They 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 you know it seems as if you see a developer on screen in a movie theater, or you know, you, you, they're they're just going completely bananas. And you know, if you're a professional developer, you're sort of thinking to yourself, you know, 
is this guy writing unit tests? Like, what is his build time? Like, how is he able, like, I swear to, like, it's like one cut shot and he's done. Like, how did he do that? Right? So when you get into coding fast, you have to sort of put aside some of your preconceived notions about what that actually means, because in many ways, we've taken coding fast as being a criticism of a developer. Oh, you code fast. Uh, right? It's like, oh, your work is untested. Uh, you know, it doesn't even work half the time, right? But in fact, coding fast is not you sitting there fervently with adrenaline and sort of typing, you know, like crazy. It's just a, what I've observed, it's, it's a collection of various practices that if you stick to them, they just speed you up, right? So, this is my working definition of coding fast. I bounced it off a couple of people. I bounced it off my boss, my boss's boss, and they all sort of agreed that this, this is sort of a defensible uh, definition. So let me draw attention to the things that are important. Continuously adding business value, right? We're not talking about a weekend or a week or a month. I mean, year over year, you're constantly adding business value over an indefinite period of time while maintaining high code, high quality code. So high quality code, I talked last year about intrinsic quality versus extrinsic. Bottom line is, we're talking about good user experience, easy work in, you know, all of the things that come with quality, not just because QA doesn't derive quality, right? Developers create quality. At a pace that exceeds expectations, that last one is where coding fast comes in. Now, anybody paying attention or used to gaming systems will say, well, wait a minute, doesn't that mean that this entire talk is about tricking people into giving you more time than you need? I actually will talk about that later on, because the answer is not as uh, simple as it sounds. So now, typical mentalities that just about everybody has, and including myself before I started to really think about it. Fast good cheap, right? It's a zero-sum game. Pick two. The thing is about this is that you'd think I'd be sitting here going, oh, coding fast, you can do all three. It's a complete lie. You have to pick two. It's actually a good model for a reason. And the answer is, is that you want to code fast. You have to, be, you have to be good and you have to be fast. And we'll get into how good you have to be. But we're not talking about someone who just started programming can go fast. You have to have a ton of experience. We'll get into that in a bit. When you get into sort of this, you go further into the mindset of a developer, it sort of ends up being in this, this, uh, the conversation becomes, well, you know, there is no real way to code fast, right? He has a way, I have a way, and really how important is it? So you end up with this sort of uh, developers throwing up their hands and saying, look, I'm going to code as fast as I feel like coding or, or whatever expectation. So there's no real sense of accountability. And this is really captured. I mean, of, of all the, of the most crystal sort of uh, summaries of this idea, uh, is in this exact scene from Office Space. Anybody, hmm. Because this might just derail the talk. Who has not seen the movie Office Space? <laughs> this is good. This is perfect. This is perfect. Feel free to Google it and watch it right now instead of being in this talk. So the bottom line is, right, it, it comes to this, this basic idea. What's the motivation, right? Who cares? Why, why should I go fast, right? I don't even like that guy, right? He's a complete pain in my ass in a lot of cases, right? And, and why am I going to sit here work really hard, and for some, I don't even like. Which sort of brings us to this notion of what is your, your personal motivation to go fast? Because that's where it comes down to. There is no manager. I've tried it. There is no manager. There's no anyone who can motivate you to code fast. There's nothing. And, and as a matter of fact, if anything, they demotivate you by coming by and asking you for status updates and things like that. <laughs> so it has, to come from, it has to come from internal, right? So if you're going to make this commitment, I'm going to code fast, then you have to say that I'm going to find my own personal motivation. So one of them, I, I found several different categories when I sort of looked at guys. One of them is this sort of deepening your philosophical knowledge of the craft, right? I'm a technologist. I really enjoy this. You know, I, I, in my free time, I read books on, on technology, right? You just, you want to get deeper in it. And the more you love something, the more you want to do it. Another one is just people who just want to get recognition. They want to get paid, right? We're in a capitalistic society. You're like, you know what? If I code faster than that guy, I'm going to get the promotion and he's not, right? So that is a motivator. Then there's this notion of I actually want to build a great product. And the fact is the faster you code, the more iterations you can do, the cheaper it is to try ideas, the easier it is for you to converge on something that the user, you know, your consumers will really, really, really like as opposed to what usually happens, which is that before you hit that ideal point in time where the product is really, really good, you have to stop where you are and you just have to ship it to market and then you sort of feel terrible when you hear that someone you know is actually using the product you built. And then the last one is, I think, really, really important. It's one that's not talked about enough, which is just having time for family, right? And just having uh, the ability to sort of leave work at work. I will say that now that I've sort of adopted this idea of just I'm going to come in, you know, eight hours, just give my best eight hours, that I leave work at work like you would not believe. And before, when it was like meetings and choppy, I didn't really even commit to source today. 
you know, I go home sort of anxious and thinking about work. Uh, but really, if you've never done it, do it. Like, it's sort of a novel concept to just start at 9 a.m. and start coding and then have a clock and just walk away from your desk and go home. But try it. You, it was very liberating, right? Because if your boss comes by and is like, hey, I need you to work the weekend, you'll look at him just like, really? Really? This wasn't enough for you? <laughs> like, blazing for 40 hours a week? It changes the conversation. No, it does not mean that suddenly your boss will go, well, now that you're coding fast, I'm totally not going to tell you to stay late and what have you. That's not how things work, right? People are, people are greedy by nature. They get a little bit of something and want more of something, but it does change the conversation. Now we get into it. Now it's going to get fun. How to code fast. Lie about your estimates. All right, everyone, have a good day. My name's Neil Green. <laughs> All right, now, get yourself in the right mindset, right? So you're a professional. You're a professional who is good and they're fast. So you remember the fast, good, uh, cheap, right? You're good and you're fast. So can anyone do this? Yes, this guy has missiles coming at him. He's going to be good and he's going to be fast. This guy has, you know, his life. Someone's life is in their hands. They're going to be good. They're going to be fast. This guy, if he makes the wrong mistake, he causes the 2008 housing crisis, right? So you, and he wasn't very good as it turns out. But, but the bottom line idea is that you want to be good to be fast, but you also need some type of pressure to make you go fast. For me, I, uh, and actually, unfortunately, sadly, one of my actual CTO of my current company is in the back, which is sort of really awkward, but it's actually presenting to him every week that is my motivation because I don't want to look like a fool. Sort of wish you weren't here, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Eliminate distractions. So basic. Like, we learn all this in college, right? In college, we're like, go to the library, go to the library, and you sit quietly and work. Then we go to work, and we do nothing but sit around and just, just be distracted all day. This, this XKCD is just so amazing. You won't, I'll move on before you can finish reading it probably, but it's so amazing. It just, it just basically epitomizes our daily life, right? Which is that you're just in the zone, you're just getting there, you're totally tearing through code, and someone just walks up to you and just starts talking a bunch of crap, right? We'll talk about them in just a second. Outlook is probably going to end being your worst time waster. With emails, you just, you're reading them, replying to them. Oh man, I wish my CTO wasn't back there. So, uh, I just, <laughs> so you just sort of ignore the strategy of ignoring them, a strategy of black holing them through Outlook rules. But you basically, you'll find this uh, with meetings as you sort of go, uh, you know, look, if you really need something from me, you'll walk up to me and knock on my door, right? You'll say, hey, Neil, notice you haven't replied to any of my emails. And it's like, oh man, word. Uh, all right, well, what's up, right? But, um, you know, you, you can literally, I, you know, you can spend two hours every morning just reading and replying to emails. Uh, so you just got to cut it out, right? You can't have that distraction. Meetings, so it's funny, like everyone's like, oh, well, meetings are bad, meetings are bad. Yeah, but they're actually much, much worse than they seem because the time... <laughs> The, the time you spend in a meeting is usually wasted, right? And maybe one out of every five meetings is a really good meeting. You have a good facilitator, good topic, everyone came together. But you, the thing that's worse is that you, you know, you came in the morning, you said, I've got a plan, you sit down, you start to code, you code, you code, you code, and Outlook says, got a meeting, and you're like, I was right in the middle of this. So you get up, you go to the meeting, and you listen to them talk. You get back to your desk, and you're like, I don't even know what I was working on. <laughs> like, I don't, what, what, and, you know, so your ID is sitting there with the cursor blinking, and you're like, what, what was I writing? Uh, I am is interesting because I am is a double-edged sword. So I am will stop people from walking up to you and asking you questions and things like that. But feel free, right, to just change your availability status and say, and say something like, you know, hey, I'm coding. Hey. You know, and you'll find that it just creates just a little bit of barrier so that people go, I don't really want to walk up to them and, you know, disturb them right now. Clearly they're concentrating. Which brings us to this thing. Oh, this thing is awesome. If you could tape a do not disturb sign on the back of your head, it would not be as good as this. Because this actually makes it so that you hear them when they ask you a question, right? <laughs> so this is the exact model of headphone that I have, right? It's very comfortable. It's very light. It fits over the ear, so it does passive noise canceling. I don't know if anybody has ever tried one of those massive, like, 600 pounds one that's supposed to be active noise canceling. First, I can't afford it. Two, you don't need it. This thing, when you put it on your head, is a do not disturb sign. Don't, I'm working. I'm obviously working, right? By itself, that should get you out of a lot of inane conversations. But there's one more thing that is even more powerful. <laughs> Humans can't really start a conversation with another human unless you make eye contact with them, right? It's true. It's true. If you simply sit there, if they're over there in your peripheral vision, and they're standing, you know they want to talk to you, and you just, even though you know they're there, you keep your headphones on, 
and just keep staring at the screen, I promise you, a lot of times they'll go away. <laughs> and it'll be awkward, because they'll stand there for a second, <laughs> sort of waiting for that, that invitation, and then they'll try to play it off, and they'll sort of like do one of these, like, oh, right, yeah. got that. <laughs> I've got that thing now. Uh, okay, I'll catch up with you later. And then, if that doesn't work, just spin around and do the crazy eyes like he's doing, right? Um, all right, so getting comfortable. The goal is you walk in 9 a.m. and you code for eight hours. That is your goal. That's what you're trying to do. You got to be comfortable, man. Sitting in one place doing one thing for eight hours, that's going to, that's going to wreck your body. The environment that I work in, I like to think of it sort of like a cockpit, right? I need a lot of space to see what I'm doing and everything I need. I want it to be at my fingertips, right? But don't take that too literally. You don't need one of those. Right? That's, that exists. That's a real thing you can buy, but that's, don't take it literally. So this is actually where I work. This is my actual desk in, in real life. This is how it looks every morning when I walk into work. I leave it like that. I have a routine. I get in. I sit down, log in. I don't check my, I never check my email. I wish to God my boss wasn't here. Grabbed uh, <laughs> my coffee cup, get some coffee, come back. And you can't see it because of the whiteout, but my IDE is always set up Blank, Google is always set up blank on the right, so I know immediately, let me get started, right? Ergonomics is the study of not having your back and neck kill you at the end of four hours of coding. Blah, 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 read up on it, I'm not going to go into it. But it does sort of start with the idea of getting a good chair. Now this right here is the Royals Royce of ergonomic chairs. It's a Herman Miller, runs you about, depending where you buy, it could run you up to $1,500 because that's got all the trimmings, right? And therefore you go to your boss and say, can I have $1,500 for my ass? And they're like, no. No, I, no. So you can go to Amazon and pick up one of these. I have this at home. That's 150 bucks. It's very portable. You can come into work. If your boss won't do it for you because they don't love you, then just get one for yourself. It's completely worth it. Wait, wait, stop. How many people here have back problems from just sitting in chair all day? Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, just, just take the advice. It's absolutely worth it. Same goes for screen real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, go to your boss and say, man, can you drop a grand on me so I can get one Thunderbolt display? It's not going to happen. So for coding, uh, just a reasonable Dell, high resolution, get two of them. That's more than enough. That's all you need. But you, the more real estate, the better. I see guys who have three or four. I don't know. I can't turn my head that far to like keep on track of it. But, but two of them covers my full peripheral vision. I do a lot of web work. My browser in the right, my ID in the left, and that works out great for me. Temperature and humidity. You would not believe how this affects your productivity. So I guarantee you, nobody here knows the temperature and humidity that you work in, but you should. Buy one of these things. They're at Home Depot. Set it right next to your desk. It's supposed to be like right around 73 or 50% humidity. Try it. If it's too high, if it's too low, it will wreck you. Just give it a shot and also track it through the day as the temperature, external temperature changes. <laughs> so I am a coffee drinker like you would not believe. Let me be very careful of what I say next. So caffeine is a full terrible drug that no one should take because it's bad for you, or so I've read somewhere. Anyway, so I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> like I drink black coffee, it's got no calories in it. French press if I can, or something like that. So there's a fantastic, if you have not seen this thing, I won't be offended if you pull it up on your laptop now. It's just uh, oatmeal talking about coffee in general, right? So but caffeine is a stimulant, right? Any stimulant, sugar, what have you, it's going to mess with you one way or the next, right? For me, I have a very fine knowledge of, depending on how sleepy I am, exactly how many ounces of coffee I need to stay in the zone and not fall out of it. Too much, you get jittery. Too little, you get drowsy. So I'm not advising you do it. But if you do it, you know, it doesn't hurt. I found it, it doesn't hurt. Touch typing. I just learned this because I researched it for the talk. The typewriter was invented in 1868. Unbelievable, right? And I had no idea of this. This photo was taken in 1917. So we've been typing for a long time. A lot of you people don't know how to touch type. Uh, so it's sort of one of those questions where no one's going to be really honest. But let me see. How many people here can't touch type? You're so, how many people, you're, how many people are lying? All right, so let me get very fast with touch typing. It's this on the diagram, fingers on home keys. You do not have to look at the keyboard. The key to touch typing is you should be able to produce error-free around 60 words per minute, right? You want to be a developer? You want to do a rename? Ever, work with a guy who can touch type and then start renaming stuff versus someone who can only use two fingers. Give me a break. You know, it, I actually think it does affect the software design of a system because me, I changed the name of a class uh, 
six or seven times as I'm creating it, right? Well, no, that's not right. No, that's right. You know, and you know, when you touch type, you just you can just iterate so much faster. It's so basic. It's so easy. In the morning, pull up one of those touch typing things on the internet that will just let you type the quick brown fox or whatever and see how many of your words per minute. Warm up, get limber, right? This is a th this will help. Subsecond builds. This topic frustrates me like you would not believe. So, I, it, you know, frustrating topics, I'm, I'm going to try to skip over and, and not spend so much time on it. But it's incredible the amount of time we waste in builds. It's astonishing. And I'm not talking about the physical time. The closest I came to physically hitting someone was when some, I said, wow, we need to improve the, the speed of our builds. And they're like, it's only 20 seconds. And I'm like, you know, that's... 20, you know, compounded, right, over time, relentless, and, uh, and furthermore, it's fixable, right? You know, it's, you can, you can affect it. It's like, oh, that's, that's divine. That's the way the world said it's going to work. No. Sit down. Think about it. Look at what it's doing, right? It's, it's, it's in the chip, right? It's in the memory. You can make it go fast. Get smart about it, right? If you've never heard of JRebel and you're a Java developer, like, Use JRebel. Like, I don't even have another way to say it, right? Don't, don't, d just when you go back to your desk, if you have a laptop, work laptop, just install JRebel and use JRebel and make your company buy you JRebel. That's it. One of the worst things builds do is they knock you out of the zone, right? Get in con, get, you know, deep in concentration. You're totally flowing with it. You do a build. And your mind starts to wonder, you know, what's on tonight? It's TV. Did I, did I leave the oven on? Did I leave the oven? I should, I should exercise more. I am getting, getting a little chubby, aren't I? Oh, the build's complete. All right, where was I? I, I don't even care anymore. What's, what's on Twitter? All right? So you can't let yourself be knocked out of the zone. Spend the time and energy. JRebel, I won't, I won't go on and on about JRebel. Get it, use it. Use an IDE. Um, how many people here are ready to walk out because I made this statement? Fantastic. Use IntelliJ. How many people are ready to walk out because I made that statement? Excellent. That's only one person, right? Just use an, just use an ID. I'm not going any further. I'm just going to say, just use an ID. Highly recommend IntelliJ. Okay. Now, for those of you who scoffed at this notion of IntelliJ, uh, I use VI and Emacs, I'm necessarily better than you as a human being. These tools, they come alive when you start dealing with keyboard shortcuts. This is the cheat sheet for IntelliJ shortcuts, right? A lot of people don't spend the time to really learn the shortcuts at all. Uh, they only learn a couple, like Control C and Control V. No, I'm just kidding. They go, you go beyond it sometimes, the renames and stuff like that. But, uh, but at the end of the day, they don't really understand, wait, wait, I didn't understand until I saw a guy who really mastered them and I couldn't even believe it. Interestingly, when I asked him how he got so good at them, he said, oh, it's because I'm, I'm not a touch typer. I have to get really good at them in order to get my productivity up. True story, honestly. So the analogy that I have with people is something that, that I've used before. Depending on your generation, you get it or you not, or, or not, but I think it's a good one. It's one of Street Fighter. Street Fighter is a large reason why I didn't do so well in high school when it came to like things like math and stuff. It's a game. Has anybody here never heard of the game Street Fighter? Thank God. All right. So the idea of the game is rapid combinations of effectively, you know, joystick movements strung together allow you to do special moves like throwing a fireball. Every character has certain moves you have to learn. They're very difficult to learn. But the key here, which is what you should be in your, your IDE, is that their muscle, their, their muscle memory, right? Just like you're in Street Fighter. You're not thinking about it. You're not thinking, okay, so I want to extract a method. Extract a method. Maybe. So alt, alt, alt shift. Wait, am I in Eclipse or an IntelliJ? Alt shift. Cause that doesn't work, right? You want to be able to say, you know, ah, oh, you know, I, I just want this to happen, right? And just it be ready, right? So, so Street Fighter rewards you when you do this really well by uh, a big, you know, cinematic. But you know, in, in this particular case, that because I clearly have too much free time, that is actually doing something. But I'll leave it up to the observers later what that's actually doing. But that takes seconds to execute, and it was doing something actually really interesting, really important. Be extremely knowledgeable. Sort of like what? What do you you mean? I have to be knowledgeable? No. Be extremely knowledgeable, right? That's the good part of the fast and the good and not cheap. You can't wait for yourself to just sort of, I got to go off, I got to Google something, I got to read a book, oh, I think I remember hearing about that. Yeah, we do it. We go to Stack Overflow all day and all night. We go and we Google stuff and what have you. But the fact is, is that the less you have to do that, the faster you're going. But it's actually more than just learning about APIs. It's about learning 
theory and philosophy, right? I don't think as an industry we spend nearly enough time talking about theory and philosophy, right? Theory is the type of stuff you get when you read these types of books, right? The Martin Fowlers, the Kent Becks, the Bob Martins of the world. And if you don't know who those people are, but uh, at the end of the day, philosophy is, is sort of what you get when you, work, when you talk to your fellow engineers, right? How do you approach this problem? What you're trying to build up is what, what I call your, your suite of rules of thumb. When you're going fast, you have to have sort of rules of thumb. So the types of rules of thumb I have is the following. I don't want a method that's over three lines. I don't want a class that's over 100 lines. I'd like my classes to, you know, hover somewhere around 30 to 50 lines. It's just rules of thumb, right? I never want to have a method take more than one argument, right? Things like that. Just, just rules of thumb. And, and as you're coding, the rules of thumb just help you because you're not making conscious decisions. You're like, okay, I need this. This is going to be the name. Okay, it's that. That's cool. That makes sense. We'll get into the consequence of that a little bit later. The thing to remember is that it's really difficult in this industry to get extremely knowledgeable. It takes a lot of work. I'm not going to kid you. I've spent God knows how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars at Barnes & Noble. A lot of my free time is spent reading and studying and things like that, and even more of it is spent practicing. So it does come at an expense. But if you want to code fast, you're going to have to put in the time. You're going to have to put in the energy. Okay. This is the part when I practiced the talk, I was like, yeah, everyone in the audience is going to roll their eyes. It's like, oh, he's working Greenfield? No kidding. <laughs> Crappy code is... You can't go fast in it, right? So there's no, there's no like, there's no like special, like, oh, well, how? He's going to tell us how. No, actually, you can't. You can't move fast in crappy code. There's just too many things that are going to get into your way every second of every day. You will go fast for 15 seconds and you'll hit something you've never, you'll hit a 30 line method with four nested if loops and 15 conditionals somehow that they fit in by using the ternary operator. And then you're, you're going to go, you're just going to, your whole thought process is going to break down and you're just going to go, okay. What were they thinking when they put this together? It's a lot like wading through peanut butter, where every step you take, you're being held back, right? You can't, you cannot move forward. It's very frustrating. And as you lose your motivation from that crappy code, it weighs on you and you sort of start to give up. So Greenfield, obviously, you buy yourself in Greenfield like you wouldn't a startup or at home. Yeah, not going to be a problem. But that's not real life. Real life is you're working in an existing code base and you need to, you need to get aggressive about, you know, what am I going to do to protect myself? One of, one strategy is sort of walling yourself off. And I've seen a guy do this at a great effect, right? Basically liberal use of adapter patterns and facade patterns, right? Just sort of like, okay, well, I'm going to put a facade in front of you, an adapter in front of you, and I'm going to make an API between you and me, and I'm going to control my little area over here. Another one is even more extreme, which is just, yeah, I'm going to make a separate code base and you're going to use it as a jar, a dependency, or a service. Like, I'm just done. I'm not going to do that. I've been known to do this, right? Is <laughs> that I don't want to, it's sort of like one of those like dating sort of things where it's like, hey, how's it going? I sort of don't want to work with your code because you sort of suck, but here's an API, right? And it's, it's sort of, you don't have to sort of take the conversation too much further, right? Um, but you can't do either of those. Um, you're going to have to, you're just going to have to clean it up. If you want to code fast, you're going to have to clean it up. Not write it over, not go to your manager, not say, give me, you know, $15 million and I'll go rewrite it for you. Just clean it up piece by piece. Great section in Clean Code by Bob Martin where he talks about this in philosophy. If you actually Google big rewrite in the sky or something like that, you'll come to his sort of small blog post on this. You got to clean it up piece by piece, right? Day by day, add a unit test, test drive it, retire a class, and just keep disciplined on it. But until you get that, you, you can't expect yourself to code fast. So go easy on yourself. Oh, so like I said before, rules of thumb, you're going as fast as you can. You are going to pick up tech debt, right? Everyone here knows what tech debt is. Good. You're going to pick it up very quickly then. Technical debt, basically when you fail to refactor something because you claim you don't have enough time, which you probably do. That's why tech debt is important, right? You're, you're accruing tech debt you have to really pay it down because you're going so fast, right? It's sort of counterintuitive because there's companies who will have like tech debt sprints or tech debt a paloozas or whatever the heck they want, right? Where you, everyone sort of says, okay, we'll stop adding features. We'll actually go back and do it right. But really, this should be happening a lot, like every hour, if not multiple times an hour, where you go really, really fast. You do a class and you go, oh, and you do some tech debt. And then just as fast as you just wrote it, pay it down, right? And in terms of technical debt, how to pay it down, there's books written on the topic, there's, you know, but, but you have to be able to spot tech debt before you can pay it down. A lot of people miss that. 
So the technique I use, and it seems to be working well, is I mark my tech debt with a refactor uh, comment instead of capital to do, capital refactor colon. And then I say specifically what I want another developer or myself to do. And then my rule of thumb is I basically keep a track of how many of these refactor comments that I have. And when I get like around 10-ish, then I just pull the ripcord and I start paying it down as aggressively as I can. This idea of flipping from going really, really fast to aggressively paying it down, analogous to sort of taking pit stops, right? And if you don't take a pit stop and just sort of take a, take a fast break, get new tires on, get fueled up, it's just going to catch up with you and you're just going to crash, right? And you can't afford for that to happen. Find creative solutions. So are we engineers? Are we scientists? Are we artists? We have to think creatively, right? Who cares? You have to, you have to not... Just because a product manager came by and gave you some requirement that makes no sense doesn't mean that you should shut down and stop thinking about what the potential solutions can be, right? You, 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 you know, yeah, okay, you're the, the PM, everyone has taken complete control out of you and you're some poor innocent lamb on the side of the road who needs protection. No, not really. You're a grown adult. You're smart. You, they were hired you because you're smart. They tell you something, come back to them and say, I've got, a, I've, I've got an alternative idea. Or you do what I do, build an alternative idea, show it to them and see if they notice, right? A lot of times they do, a lot of times they don't, right? <sighs> when I talk about being creative, there's so many ways to skin a cat, right? There's tons of ways to do it. And some of them won't be immediately obvious until you actually take a step back and go, I need to find a way to get this done quickly, right? Uh, now, don't, I'm not going to say it's not fraught with difficulty, right? It's that you're going to still run into things that, that get in your way. But the point is, is that you have to get in the mindset of, hey, I've got something crazy that I want you to build for some reason. And you have to say, okay, fine. Let's see how we can get this done. Uh, recomposition into new features. This one topic, this actually was, in, this was a large part of my Lego Play-Doh uh, talk last year. Um, uh, it, it came from a talk I saw by Martin Fowler where he presented his design stamina hypothesis. And he's basically saying that in the first, let's say, week or so, Right, week, two weeks, maybe the full month, you know, having noted and just coding as fast as you can. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit faster. But when you have a design, you, you'll reach a point where it'll start to level out. And that's the blue line. When you, sorry, 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 I flipped that around. It's the orange line where you just continually add, add features over time because you have a nice foundation. And when in the talk, he didn't say in the diagram, but he talks about the fact that you get that because you're now starting to recompose new features out of existing objects and classes. So last year I used this, this analogy of uh, Lego and Play-Doh that worked well, but this year I'm, I'm going to try a different one, which is just for this idea of home construction. When you, when you sort of approach anything in, in software, you, you shouldn't be thinking about it like building a house out of wood, right? Is that, that's not a very bright idea, right? You, you want to be thinking of what can I reuse, what can I use to implement this feature? Within your own code base, if you have a rich domain model, or, you know, if you have a full suite of unit tests, especially in Java, a full suite of unit tests, a rich domain model that is in lockstep with the descript, the words that the business uses to describe the business problem, what you will find is the following. They will come to you and in that same business language ask you to build something new. But you already have a domain model, so you can immediately go to this is how I could possibly construct it. And you'll start fabricating things out of what you already have. Combine that with existing libraries and jars and frameworks and things like that, and you can really start to craft a system writing very little code, right? And so this is, this is sort of one of the, the many important bits of actually coding fast, is that don't write a lot of code, right? Use, reuse as much as you can, right? Oh, the frameworks are awful. I aesthetically believe that this framework isn't very good. Well, who cares? Learn the API so that you don't have to do the same thing. Do you really want to write another SQL statement? Seriously. Do you really want to parse a post? Come on, right? Just use the existing framework. Let's keep going. And people say, well, I'm so creative and unique that my business has something completely novel and you couldn't possibly use anything. Well, guess what? Create beautiful, elegant, original things using prefabricated components. This thing here, trust me, nobody got out a hammer and a chisel. And made this thing, right? This is mostly Home Depot and hard work, right? Work for visual requirements. Fortunately, the world seems to have agreed that we shouldn't work from large requirements documents. We've gotten smaller, but we, we still haven't quite made the leap to the fact that the human mind is really good at absorbing a lot of information from something that it sees, right? So that leads us to a, to a couple different conclusions, which is that how far can we push this thing? 
I live by a whiteboard, right? I, I clean my whiteboard constantly to make sure, and, and this is sort of, and you know, people who work with me would know, wow, he's a little, oh, you know, about cleaning the whiteboard. But as soon as the idea is finished, I clean it to a high sheen. And what I want is that when someone walks into my cube or walks into a room that I'm in, they immediately feel like it just sucks ideas out of them. They're like, well, the whiteboard's clean. Let me just start drawing on it. And you start iterating on the whiteboard, which is ultra cheap. What do you want? Well, I want this. I want that. Uh, it's that. Oh, that's a stupid idea. Let me, let me erase it. Uh, and a lot of the times, some, a lot of requirements I work out or I get approved right on my whiteboard that's right next to me. Um, but when you actually need to pr produce an artifact, start off with something visual, right? So this, uh, this, this one thing, I mean, think about how to describe this in text. Right? This is like a 50-page document, right, to describe the same thing. What you're relying upon is the fact that you're not an idiot, right? You're pretty, it's like search, oh, oh. Want validation? Validation's extra. Yeah, it's assumed. You have a search, you're going to do validation, right? You don't need every specific detail on every specific thing. You're smart. And if you need specific details, go back to the people who would have written the document anyway. This allows you to code. This, the, the best thing this does is that from that first meeting of, we have an idea about a new initiative, you go back to your desk and you start building the initiative, right? A general idea, start working. Balsamic is the tool that actually generated this one. It is huge. It is amazing. You can give it to people who are non-technical, non-business owners. They can learn it in a heartbeat and start pumping out requirements. Best effect ever of Balsamic. You can get two people fighting about a requirement, leave you alone. Because they'll start throwing Balsamic mockups back and forth to each other. Uh, you know, if you know Visio really, you know, really well, by all means use Visio. Omnigraffle for the Mac or for the iPad. Estimate wisely. Finally, we get to Get to estimating wisely. At this point, we're right. Like, I think we're we're into ethics at this point, right? When it comes to estimation, we're into ethics. What type of person are you, right? You can probably lie about estimates your whole career and never get caught, right? Because only you know what's in your head. You can get called on it by developers who know you really well or what have you, but you you know you can push that as hard as you want to push it, right? But at the end of the day, it comes down to you know who you want to be when you grow up, right? What type of person you really want to be. It's your own personal philosophy, but, but make no bones about it, right? Is that if I start working for a company who's never hired a developer before in their life, and I come and I go at 110% speed, they just assume that's normal. Well, that's how fast every developer goes. So I'm not going fast to them, right? So there is some level of expectation management. But the bar is set so incredibly low in our industry that it's nothing to exceed expectations. If you, you know, someone oh, we want a cred table that, uh, you know, allows you to manage the value of this in the database and blah, 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 blah. And then someone walks along and they say, yeah, I'll bang that in Rails in like 20 minutes. That's the type of mentality you want to have, right? Creative solution. Let me go bang this out. Now, did you just give an estimate? Yeah. But, you know, what, what do you care? But we'll get to that in a second, right? So this is how a lot of people estimate, right? They just sort of say, you know, whatever. There's no such thing as an estimate. So, I don't care, right? Let's just roll the dice. Uh, what do you think it should be? I think it should be two days. Excellent. So it's three days. Let's move on. Another one is this sort of, you'll see this in architects a lot, the not so good architects. You'll also see it with people who formerly have been, you know, in a particular role, but now they're no longer in it. Is this sort of perverted arrogance when it comes to, I know how long this takes, my son, because I have done this thing before. It's also not the way to do it. You want to th think of yourself sort of as a, as a sort of a seasoned, you know, sea captain who's sort of seen it all, right? And, and they go, hey, I'm going to build this. And you go, well, I was just in that code yesterday. I think, you know, I, I know what I have to do to do this. So rather than spend time talking about it, I can go back to my desk and build it, right? That is, that is important with coding fast. You do estimates. You have to do estimates. But they're coming from a different place. They're coming from your tactical understanding of the code base, not for some theoretical understanding of just giving up or waving your hands. Pairing. I thought so long and hard. It's like, okay, quick pause. Let's talk, like, how am I going to do this section? Can I, can I give a talk without talking about pair programming? It's like, God, how do I say that? You know, which side do I come on? i got friends on both sides of the fence. Okay, this is what I came up with. So pairing is like marriage, right? When it works, it's amazing. It's beautiful. But when it doesn't work, it's horrific and terrible and turns people off from it for the rest of their life. Pair programming, I've seen it fail maybe in 90% of the cases and 10% and of the cases. And in my mind's eye, I've always felt this is sort of like marriage, 
right, is that you don't really know what's making it work. And, and because people approach it in this sort of like completely naive way, like I person I never met before may have a personal vendetta against me, we're going to work together and just totally it's going to work out. It usually doesn't. And, and people are like, well, pair programming as a concept is flawed. No, it's not. It's just that just like a relationship, they're just not, you know, I, I can't have the same relationship with one person I can have with another. There has to be a certain level of connection, right? And, oh, 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 that sounds really personal. We don't like to do that in corporate America. Well, that's fine, and you'll never pair programming within your organization. Personalities clash. Take a Myers-Briggs, right? Myers-Briggs. Take a Myers-Briggs test. No, it doesn't define who you are or define your career, but it does give you an idea of how compatible you may or may not be with someone else, right? Your value systems could be completely at odds. With pairing, you want to end up sort of like an old married couple, right? You don't always agree. But you sort of complete each other's sentences and you know, you sort of know where each other is going, right? Is that you don't, you don't need a lot of talk, you don't need a lot of conversation. If anybody's ever seen an effective pair, two people sitting at the same computer working, they're a lot like that. There's, there's cursing, there's disagreements, there's like, we shouldn't do it that way. But you move past the disagreements really, really quickly. You know when to compromise, you know when not to compromise. All of the fights, the big fights have already happened, so they're just going and going and going. Now, there's another version of pairing that you see a lot that seems productive, but it's not. It's actually sort of the antithesis of coding fast, and I call it master apprentice. You'll end up with, hey, you two pair up. Yeah, we're pairing, but only one guy is really typing, and, the, and he's basically teaching the other guy. This is probably good for the organization and for the world and like all the things that make us warm and happy and have a sense of well-being as people, but it's not really coding fast, right? It's a teaching session. So when I do that, I, I sort of, in my mind's eye, you know, I'm pairing with this guy. He maybe, he hasn't, uh, you know, he, he's more junior than I am. So I'm not trying to code fast. I'm trying to give him a very good instructional session. So I sort of shift my gears completely. But if anybody's ever seen one of these, it's, you know, they get that feeling, of, eh, this doesn't seem very fast and that's why, right? Adaptation. The Japanese, you know, they have a word, or at least in martial arts, they have a word called bunkai. And the idea is that, you know, in, in sort of the classroom, you might be teaching, you know, a punch and a kick, you know, in, in martial arts. But when you get onto the street, when you get into a real life situation, you've got to adapt to whatever's happening to you. You'll get your ass kicked, right? This is, this is the same way. Everything I'm talking about is, it, you know, leads up to this basic idea, which is adaptation, right? You have to be flexible. You have to think on your feet, right? The emergency room doctor, when they're, you know, something goes wrong, they don't just throw down the scalpel and say, you know what, this isn't going the way I wanted it to go, right? The same way, you know, the missile's coming at you. You don't say, you know what, I'm just going to hit eject, right? This is just too stressful for me. I like to think of when I code as sort of a real-time strategy game, uh, which is sort of all about StarCraft, right, as far as I'm concerned, because I love StarCraft. But, but the basic idea is that sort of as you approach your day, as you approach the initiative, the project, whatever, yeah, you're going to have to have a plan, right? You're going to have to have a strategy that's backed up by some tactics. And, you know, you, you, uh, you need that, right? You need to, you need to be uh, grounded in something so that you're, you're building something with some structure, right? You're not just throwing stuff up against the wall. You're saying that, okay, this is what I'm thinking here. I'm going to have a relational database here, a NoSQL database there. I'm going to make that into a service layer. You know, you, you have your basic ideas. These are requirements. The requirements are going to need this data field to be added there. And so you have your strategy. Um, as always, right, you know, as a general rule, you don't want to go so far that you map out everything. Uh, just, you know, we call that big divine design up front or what have you. But it also comes to this idea of someone just gave you a 50-page requirements document and you're like, okay, well, since you spent the time, obviously that's what you want. They don't know what they want. They don't know what they'll want until they, until they actually see it. So you can't, you can't sort of rigidly stick to a plan. You have to constantly adapt, right? And the reason why is because in the real world, things get crazy really quick. Someone gets sick. Someone gets pissed off. Someone leaves the company, and they're the only ones who knew that part of the system, right? The database guy won't get back to you. Adapt, adapt, adapt. If there's one thing to take away from this talk, it's constantly adapt to go fast. Uh, think about it like a shark, right? A shark cannot breathe unless it's moving through water. Always think of yourself, am I coding? Am I coding? Am I coding? There's a mantra I repeat to myself. Everything's going to work out so long as I'm coding, right? So when I'm sitting there, I'm just like, okay, requirements are changing. People don't know what they're doing and, and things aren't going the way I want to. But if I continually introduce code into the system and delete code from the system, right? The code, the system is constantly evolving. Everything's going to be okay. Questions? <laughs> That's the end of the talk.